Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on rebuilding the American economy. We're still feeling the devastating impact of this pandemic, and now we're less than a week from an election that will determine just what kind of recovery we will have. We've had two devastating shocks to our economy in the past 20 years. Uh, as many of you know, after the 2008 financial crisis, Black American wealth in the form of home ownership was decimated. Before the pandemic, Black Americans had home ownership rates at levels from the 1950s before the Fair Housing Act was signed. And now we have a crisis that has wiped out over 40% of Black small businesses. There are few individuals as well placed to speak about what an inclusive recovery looks like and how we get there. And we have two of them with us today. I'm thrilled to have Ariel Investments co-CEO John Rogers and Charles Phillips, the co-chair of the Black Economic Alliance and co-founder and managing partner of Recognize with us today. John is the co-CEO with Melody Hobson of Ariel Investments, the first minority owned investment management company. He's also the co-founder of the Black Corporate Directors Conference and sits on numerous corporate boards, including Nike, McDonald's and the New York Times. He also sits on the board of the Obama Foundation. Charles Phillips is the co-founder and managing director of Recognize, a technology investing and transformation company. Prior to Recognize, he served as chairman of the board of directors and CEO of N4, an enterprise software applications provider. He was just named to the board of American Express, congratulations, Charles, and yeah. sits on the boards of Viacom CBS, the Apollo Theaters, and sat on President Obama's Economic Recovery Task Force. He is, of course, also the chair of the Black Economic Alliance. Thanks to both of you for joining us this afternoon. Before we dive into questions, I just want to remind the audience that you can use the Q&A function at any time to ask questions. And we'll uh, start off with a couple of questions and then go to Q&A. I want to just start by asking both of you if you are optimistic about whether or not we are at an inflection point. And if you are optimistic, what is making you hopeful? And uh, John, I'll start with you. Okay, well, thank you. I'm having a couple of things that are making me more optimistic than normal. Um, in this tragic time of uh, after George Floyd's murder and the challenges that we face in this country, um, doors are opening up for African-American entrepreneurs and business leaders in ways that I've never actually seen before in my 37 year career at, at Ariel. I've been getting inbound calls from CEOs of public companies, CEOs of large family owned businesses saying, can you help us think through how we can get more diverse, how we can work with minority owned firms, how we can have uh, uh, minority executives in our leadership roles. You know, people are just calling out of the blue to get advice. Uh, they're also calling Melody Hobson for similar advice. Um, they're calling with also with rec wanting recommendations for corporate boards. And that's been kind of a big deal. And so it's just, it's, I'm optimistic that the corporate world is moving in the right direction. Uh, they're feeling the pressure, they're feeling the need. And then secondly, I would say with the most progressive Congress we've ever had in the country's history, when you have a Maxine Waters as chair of the finance, um, uh, the Financial Services Committee of the House and Joyce Beatty, the head of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, they're pushing large banks and financial institutions to do the right thing. Um, Congressman Cleaver and, and Congressman Kennedy sent letters to all the top 25 uh, endowments in the country, university endowments, pressuring them and reminding them, them that they have a responsibility to work with black businesses in everything they do, especially with the tax breaks and benefits they get from a government. So this leadership in Congress, I think is gonna be a really big tailwind for all of us as we create, try to get opportunities, whether it's in the nonprofit world or in the corporate world. Thank you. And Charles, are you feeling optimistic? And if so, why? I would say, yes, I am. And uh, the conversation to John's point seemed more sustainable. Like this time, it's not just a 30 day conversation. We're on to the next news cycle and it feels different. I'm doing everything I can to make sure that it's not just a 30 day news cycle for sure. But uh, the fact that so many people calling, asking for a list of next generation board members who are black that they can start to you know, interview people on. There's several of us got together and put together a list of 100 executives and gave it to them. Uh, recruiters are calling us, boards are calling us. Uh, I had a call with a group of the largest uh, venture capitalists in the world and same thing, we haven't been investing in 
uh, companies led by you know black entrepreneurs, but we're not connected to them. How can we change that? So we have some plans working on that we can talk about. And then I was just having breakfast this morning with a couple of CEOs and they were saying, my employees are forcing me to talk about that. I said nothing when George Ford came out and there was an uproar and they wanted to know what I thought and they wanted me to take a position. So it dawned on me, I can no longer ignore this, even for my own employees, that if I want to attract the best people, you have to have some values and express some purpose. And so I just think it's permeating in a way that is unusual. You saw the head of the Yale Endowment came out, I think two days ago and said, he's looking for my more diverse managers. They never talked about that a year ago. So I'm hoping these, all these conversations, people are putting themselves on the hook and that it'll be hard to walk it back that once you've been out there so publicly. And so this is all good for us. And uh, if you look at kind of the state of the economy, yes, yeah, not great now, but the cost of capital is low, but it's lots of capital available. If we can get our fair share of it, uh, there's some hope for changing things dramatically, hopefully. That's great. I mean, you both sit on a number of corporate boards that have enormous influence over the economy, in particular in financial services. Um, you know, Business Journal just released a report showing that the four largest banks um, have just made have made 91% fewer uh, 7A loans to Black businesses in 2019 than in 2007 before the financial crisis. And similarly, the Small Business Administration has made 84% uh, less loans to Black businesses. So talk a little bit about you know the role that the private sector can play in changing some of these stats especially when it comes to access to capital for black businesses well thank you uh, you know i think that of course we need access to capital and the data that you've talked about is very very disturbing but one of the things that i talked to reverend jackson and reverend sharpton a lot about is as, as important as access to capital is it's equally important to have access to customers Mm -hmm. So, as you mentioned, I serve on the board of McDonald's. If you look at the Black Enterprise list of top 100 companies, five of the top suppliers, uh, five, top, five of the top 20 suppliers in that list are McDonald's suppliers. And the reason I bring that up, these companies that have become hundreds of millions of dollars in sales companies, multi-generational wealth being created, jobs, thousands of jobs created in our communities, the reason they've been successful is McDonald's made an agreement when they started those businesses to buy sausages if, you know, from this company and ice cream toppings from this company and other products from other companies. And you need to have those anchor customers to build your business. You need capital, but you need customers. And we need to get corporate America to understand that if you look at a place like JP Morgan Chase or other major banks that should be lending more to our community we also have to remind them that those institutions are literally spending billions and billions of dollars on all kinds of services. They hire law firms, they hire public relations firms, they advertise in magazines and on television, they use you know, advertising agencies, public relations firms, government affairs firms, technology firms. And my, most of the time they're spending less than one tenth of 1% of their revenue is going to people of color. Now they know if they construct a new building somewhere, they know they're supposed to do 20, 25% set aside on minority construction. That's a great business, that's important, but our economy has become a professional services, financial services and technology-based economy, and we have to push these institutions to do business with us. And then we'll have a chance to be able to, when you have great customers, you can get all the capital you need to be able to build your business. Yeah, to, yeah I would say, oh, go ahead. Just on that point, I guess the feedback that I've gotten from a lot of small businesses, because I've asked the same question, is a lot of them already have loans or don't want to take out more debt uh, that they have to pay back. They, what they want is equity. Uh, they want to meet investors who can invest in my business and so I can share some of the risk. And that's what uh, venture capitalists and private equity companies do. Uh, now, not all of them will invest in small companies, but there are some that do these micro investments. And so is there a way to get you partners because they do more than capital. They help coach your business, help build the networks that John is talking about access to customers. So uh, shifting the mindset a little bit so we can get some investors to help them build those companies. That's one of the things BEA has been working on. Uh, we are setting up about a $25 million center for entrepreneurship to connect them with VCs. Uh, at HBCUs uh, here to be announced shortly, hopefully by January. And so they need people who are professional business builders and willing to invest equity in these companies. 
You both mentioned how important it is to have diverse asset managers, um, to have more people of color managing these assets. So Yale is one place. How do we ensure that as we get these diverse uh, asset managers that more opportunity flows beyond the managers themselves, but also to the black community and black businesses um, in general? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um... What we've done at Ariel, as you know, we started a conference 18 years ago uh, that you alluded to earlier, the Black Corporate Directors Conference. And Charles Tribbett from Russell Reynolds was our original partner. He's still a partner. Deloitte became a partner about five years ago. And what we've really tried to do is to not only bring together uh, 200 directors now, we've gone from 35 directors to now 200 directors come every year. And Charles is kind to come and speak to the group uh, a couple of years ago. It was terrific. And at that conference, we are reminding all of us that are in leadership roles that we have a responsibility to fight for economic justice once we're in the boardroom. And that it's up to, up to us to fight for economic opportunity. And every year at the conference, we have a conscience of the conference. It could be the, the late Congressman John Lewis. It could be Harry Belafonte we've had. We've had Eric Holder and Valerie Jarrett, Reverend Jackson, Reverend Sharpton, um, you go down the list, uh, former Ambassador Andy Young, to just remind people that people lost their lives. People fought so hard to get these doors open for us in these leadership roles. And so when we're in these leadership roles, if we don't speak up, we're giving cover for the white guys to continue to spend money with each other. So to your point, it is up to us to make sure that we're employing each other, that we're working with minority owned businesses, and at our conference every year, when Melody interviews people, whether black or white CEOs, she's reminding them of the power that they have to uh, spend money with black businesses, to insist majority companies have black partners on the relationship whenever you hire an outside law firm or accounting firm or what have you, and that you give your philanthropy to black owned civil rights organizations, just not to the local symphony or the opera or the big university in town. So what we're trying to do is train all of us to realize we have a responsibility if we're in these leadership roles as entrepreneurs, as board members, as executives, to be looking out for each other in every decision that's being made. And if we were doing that, we wouldn't have lost so many of our outstanding businesses that have gone away because these large institutions continue to want to do business with white males only. And uh, we've gotten away from fighting for each other. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, uh... In the private market, in other words, the type of business I'm in where you're funding private companies, it's you do have the ability to make more decisions on which type of companies that you're investing in. And the way it works today, uh, what's called deal sourcing, you're looking for emerging companies to invest in with an idea and entrepreneur, it's you rely on your network, you rely on bankers you've worked with in the past, other VCs who will do a club deal with you, people you went to school with, and they end up going to the same places all the time. So I do feel, feel that with more diverse managers who have different networks and know different people, it would help because you're thinking differently about where am I going to source deals? If you go back to the same circles, yeah, you're going to get the same result. And that's what happened you know, for the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, Charles, you were part of President Obama's Economic Recovery Task Force. As you think about what the Biden, hopefully Biden administration, um, will be having to do to um, to create an inclusive recovery, but you know, even if it's not Biden, we are going to need to prioritize some uh, economic policies that will make sure that. Black folks aren't left behind again. Um, what would you be advising um, the next administration to do in terms of prioritizing and what kinds of things should they avoid to uh, make sure that this is really an inclusive economy that doesn't leave any community behind? Yeah, I would say BEA has had several conversations with the Biden economic team on these topics and they've incorporated some of our recommendations and some of the immediate things that we borrowed from the Obama administration is to do things like let's recapitalize the CDFIs, uh, community development financial institutions. These are these small financial institutions that lend to black businesses. They're in the neighborhoods. So they're not the big JP Morgans, these big banks. They're very small organizations. The more capital they have, the more they can lend out. So let's set $100 billion aside for them. That's how you reach people quickly who are building black businesses, number one. 
And secondly, if we have more relief programs like PPP, they missed out on the whole first round of that because they didn't know how to apply. They didn't have the automated systems to do it the way the big companies did. So let's set that aside as well. And let them apply for those loans. Uh, there's money set aside for entrepreneurship, for refunding the Small Business Administration's minority program. A lot of those things just got cut over the last four years. They got decimated. And so rebuilding those things back up, we can just start there. And a lot of that's in the plan already. Great. And John, do you have any, would you have any advice to give to the next administration in terms of priorities? Well, I continue to believe that we have to build wealth in the Black communities. You know, when I was coming along here in Chicago, we had Johnson Publishing that had Ebony and Jet, you know, thousands of employees, extraordinary philanthropy to the United Negro College Fund, et cetera. We had Johnson Products, Afro Sheen and Ultra Sheen. And George Johnson built the biggest, large, largest black bank in the country, Independence Bank. He started Soul Train with Don Cornelius. You know, he, we built, we had these great businesses that did wonderfully well. And like George Johnson also was a philanthropist. He was helping Dr. King make payroll at critical times in the, in the movement. And um, he would be responsible for 60 tables at the Urban League dinner. So what I wanna do is bring back strong black owned businesses where we can employ each other, support each other's companies, create our own philanthropy instead of having to go to the white America for all of the philanthropy. And to do that, we have to you know, follow them in the footsteps of what Harold Washington and Maynard Jackson and, and Coleman Young did. They always insisted that whenever people came to town, wherever they were, that they had to work with black entrepreneurs. You know, if you were coming in and you were doing business in Atlanta and you had only white people, Maynard was gonna send you packing. We need to bring that kind of spirit so that everyone who's doing business with the federal government understands that they should be working with minority-owned companies or making sure there are African-American leaders at the white companies that are working on the relationship with government. Also, they control lots of assets that people don't think about. The Smithsonian Museum has a huge endowment. We don't think any money goes to black people. We don't, maybe it's some rounding error. It's the Kennedy Center, Gaudet University, the Holocaust Museum, uh, many, many other institutions um, that government has a say in where they haven't found the, um, what's the word, the wherewithal to get these institutions that are in Washington, D.C. to work with Black-owned businesses outside of construction. And you know, the Smithsonian's a great example. They use Herman Russell's construction firm to build a Black museum. But if you go and talk to the Smithsonian about managing part of their endowment or being one of the law firms they work with or accounting firms they work with, that's for the, in their perception, that's for the smart white guys. You know, those opportunities are not open for us. And then of course the government has over oversight of big assets pools like the PBGC and the federal thrift and on and on federal railroad trust. We can get much more opportunities there if we're asking the right questions and having the spirit of a Maynard or a Harold Washington. We're hoping that Biden and Kamala bring that same spirit. And I've been so far very impressed with them and their staff. And I think they're, they've got the right spirit. They've got the right values. They learned from a great leader in Barack Obama. So hopefully they'll bring that spirit in, and hope open up doors for us for the first time. Great. And I wouldn't leave out the, the Federal Reserve uh, either. So they stood up nine new facilities over the last four to five months to stabilize the market, um, get some commercial people out, all sorts of facilities over $300 billion quickly, and uh, very little of that went through minority broker dealers. Uh, they were in a hurry, granted, so they picked you know, BlackRock, who they you expect them to pick. But I've been pressuring them, let's share some of that. Yes, there's always a crisis that comes up, you have to move quickly, but plan on that. You know, that doesn't mean you can't be in a position to use minority broker dealers. And there's, there's some out there, and they're not taking any risk. This is just transactions that they have to execute on behalf of the government. Great. So I want to remind the audience again to use the Q&A function to ask questions. We have a couple of questions rolling in. And so um, I'll start with uh, Lorna Johnson, who asks, um, hi, John, thank you for always supporting the business community. You mentioned the company calling, looking for board members, uh, looking for people of color. Is there a process you could help to guide folks who are interested on getting uh, on the list, um, particularly from different parts of the country uh, who are interested in, in being considered for these kinds of positions? Well, thank you. We do a couple of things. Um, one, we always recommend our, you know, our, our, our partner I mentioned earlier on our Black Directors Conference is Charles Trivet from Russell Reynolds. He's the dean in the country 
on uh, Blackboard searches for the, some of the largest companies in the world. And he's just an extraordinary expert in this field. So we always recommend him. But at the same time, we keep a list at Ariel when we get calls. Um, and we do it for two reasons. One, you know, Melody Hobson and I do get calls from people saying, do you know, who do you know? And we like to be able to be helpful at getting CEOs thinking about here are some African-American directors who can fit in, fit in on your board and do a great job for you. Secondly, as, as, as managing public mutual funds like we do at Ariel and managing separate accounts for large endowments and foundations, we feel it's the right thing for us to do to push all the companies we invest in to have diverse boards. So we have uh, invested in, um, we can point to over 50 times now in Ariel's existence where we've been able to get a company that we've invested in to have what we call a Jackie Robinson moment and have their first black board member. It could be from Sotheby's uh, with Don Stewart um, to John's, Jones Lang LaSalle with Marty Nesbitt. And we can just go on and on and on where we had again 50 times where we've been able to get somebody on a board that we've invested in by telling them, we don't wanna be invested in you if you look like a 1940s company. We wanna invest in you if you look like a 21st century company and your board is a way for you to see that. And we tell people, our competitors are not doing that. Fidelity can't, as far as I know, point to 50 directors of diverse directors they've been able to put on boards or T. Rowe Price or Janus or the big fund complexes. We're the little guy, we're David versus Goliath and we've been able to have that kind of impact by insisting with our management teams that they have to have diversity on their board and particular African-Americans on their board. Um, here's another question somewhat related. What advice would you give to African-Americans who wish to join uh, corporate boards from uh, Diane Ashley? Charles, go first. Since I... Yeah, so I would say, uh, well, first to round out what John was saying, add on to that, uh, we need more people putting pressure on these companies to think like that. So one of the services we're talking to is a company called Institutional Shareholder Services, ISS. So this is a, if you're not in this, you would probably have not have heard of them, but they're pretty important. So they're a third party that recommends board slates. In other words, when you put up a board slate, they can vote for it or against it or recommend for it against it. And a lot of people look at that to decide whether they vote for this board member or not. So they have enormous influence. And so what they did a few years ago is saying, we're not gonna approve a board if it's not a certain percentage of women. And that got the women getting on a lot of boards because you didn't want ISS coming out against your board recommendation. We need that same thing to happen for people of color. So that's one thing. And then you have some states that are taking the lead, like California passed a law, same thing for women, but they haven't done them for people of color. That certain percentage of your incorporating California have to be women. We need the same thing to happen for people of color. So as far as getting on the board, there, there are board practices in these recruiting firms. That's all they do. So whether it's Russell Reynolds or one of these firms, um, making yourself known to them because they have a separate practice and they're all looking for diverse board members right now. So the list that we came up with, that's who we're giving it to. So they, because they're getting calls that we're not getting. So they need to be better armed. So that's one place to start. Great. Um, Brandon Upson asks, with the increased interest in diversity, how do we continue the progress and hold these companies accountable beyond this moment? Well, I, I think so, it's, no, go ahead, Jen. I'll say it goes back to history. I think we have to support our civil rights organizations. You know, Mark Morial, Reverend Jackson, Reverend Sharpton, who I saw yesterday here in Chicago, these civil rights leaders have been able to make a real change and put pressure on these institutions to do the right thing. Um, I think we have to support, we don't give enough money to our civil rights organizations. We don't show up enough at push on Saturday mornings or to their conferences during the summer. We've got to support our civil rights leaders. Secondly, again, I mentioned our progressive political leaders. As Congress is the most progressive Congress we've seen in history, we have to get, you know, write the checks, show up at their rallies, because the more Joyce Beatty's and Maxine Waters and uh, leaders like that, it makes all the difference in the world in getting, holding people accountable on these very, very important issues. And if, if we um, don't have those progressive leaders in place, we're not gonna be able to hold people accountable. But when you have them and now is, when you, when you are in power, like the Democrats are now in the house, you have subpoena power. And you can hold these companies, hold their feet to the fire and push them to do the right things. So political empowerment, civil rights empowerment will, what will, is what's needed to hold these institutions accountable to the promises and commitments they've made to our, com our community and too often have not lived up to the values they say they care about. 
I think we can do a lot with transparency and that most companies today don't disclose their uh, racial makeup. A few companies do, they put it on their website. And so I think the rule having just forcing disclosure in a proxy or in an annual report, uh, people start to resolve things when they're getting measured and it's public. And some companies like PayPal started doing this five years ago and they said, we're not where we wanna be, here's where we are, we're gonna change it, hold us accountable, and they did it. So I, I think just transparency can do a lot because people don't wanna be embarrassed amongst the peers in the public. Charles, you are, you just started a technology company, you've run a technology company, and I know that you think a lot about how Black uh, communities are being left behind by the wealth that's being created in technology. What are some of the things that we can be doing from a public policy point of view, but also that the private sector, technology companies themselves, can be doing to ensure that as we are entering this new phase of you know, the future of work, which is here with folks working from home and all of the technology, the changes that's bringing, um, how do we ensure that black communities are part of the wealth that's being created in this new innovation economy? Yeah, this technology displacement is a real risk, especially for black people with getting displaced. Uh, something like 43% of the tasks that we, uh, we uh, execute today in the top 800 occupations could be replaced by technology that exists today. And it's only gonna get better. So if we don't get out of some of these low wage manual jobs, we're gonna be on the front lines of getting displaced. So a couple of things we could be doing is one, uh, the 18 billion we spend a year on job training at the federal level, it's usually not that effective. It is not directed that much in our communities but more importantly, it's the wrong skill sets not connected to companies. I would shift that into more public private training. So the companies are training exactly the type of skills that they need and make that more entrepreneurial. That's one thing we could do. And then secondly, uh, as we, we need to change the way we think about college and skills, a lot of these jobs don't require a college degree, and that actually keeps us out of a lot of jobs because we you know, just have a lower rate of graduation. A lot of these are jobs that need eight to 10 weeks of training. And so the, one of the programs we're working on at BA is talking to about 30 companies to commit to training or hiring from a workforce development program for jobs that don't require those degrees that need eight to 10 weeks and let's not over-credentialize these jobs with college degrees. So, so that's another thing that we can do. So we just got to think creatively about how to get people the right skill sets as quickly as possible. Uh, Marcus Glover asks, is there space for new products and services targeted at Black communities that seek to directly reduce areas of racial inequality in health, wealth, and education? In health, wealth. Uh, I don't know, the, the, certainly anything that can reduce, uh, improve healthcare, because that's one of the industries of automated, uh, there's an enormous amount of private equity going into that and venture capital. I don't know if it's targeted directly at African Americans, but if there's value there and you're helping people live a better life, uh, there's enormous capital available and people are interested in that, I agree with that. So I don't know how well you can target it, but to me, if you start in the black community and you end up serving other people, that's not a bad thing either. Um, are either of you, Tina Walls asked, are either of you aware of um, good programs that help young people get started in terms of businesses, expanding their network, getting skills and capital? Um, Charles, maybe you could talk a little bit about the, the small business program that you mentioned at HBCUs. Yeah, so we're working on that now, and that's designed to connect people with VCs, with professional business builders who will teach courses and basically give you the skill sets what she's talking about. So that's one avenue, but there are lots of incubators around. None of them have scale as a problem and they're hard to find, but the incubators, that's essentially what they do. You have uh, these micro loans and micro investments surrounded by some people who can give you advice and, and build your network. I would look for an in a local incubator. So it's a lot of those in almost every city now. And the problem is there's so many of them so fragmented, it, people don't know what to find. And so that's another problem we got to figure out how to resolve. Can we create a central directory to help people find more of these resources? Okay, so EJ Scott asks, um, what is the best way to ensure that black people are not left out um, when we basically lump people together as people of color? Um, so basically, how do we ensure that the, the, the unique needs of black folks are met um, and are not sort of erased by being lumped together with underserved communities or minorities? 
No, I think that's really important. And it, it's just fascinating. You know, I've been on a lot of calls recently around these issues of economic inclusion. And inevitably, if there's a white organization on the line or on the Zoom or what have you, they'll start to talk about this diversity statistics. And they want to just talk about broad diversity that includes every specific diverse part of the community and not talk about African Americans. And they'll, they'll have numbers of 15, 18, 20% participation. And then when you ask them about Black, they'll either tell you they don't know or they'll sheepishly admit it's less than 1%. So I think we have to insist that we get all of the data broken out by ethnicity and not accept this big lump together with everyone else. You know, we are the ones that came here as slaves. You know, we know if you know, if you read uh, Nicole Hannah Jones's book, I mean, her magazine article in the New York Times, I, I keep it on my desk because I love it so much. You know, what is owed? She goes through and shows the history in this country of how whenever we start to get ahead, the country finds a way to, you know, destroy our businesses in Tulsa or destroy the people's grocery store or, you know, have these reigns of terror in different parts of our country where we don't have a chance to really build wealth from generation to generation. And we all know what we've been through. We know the challenges we face in this country from Jim Crow to historical uh, segregation. And it's kind of just so disturbing that people want to have us lumped together with every other ethnic group and not allow us to really tell our story and get equal opportunity that we deserve based upon what we've been through in this country and the unconscious or implicit bias that we still live with in today's society. And uh, many of the other ethnic groups do not have that same type of implicit unconscious bias as way, way people lump us together in a way that we're not uh, as valued and people don't think that we can handle things that we truly can handle and don't respect our talent and our gifts and our work ethic and how accomplished we can be when only we're given an equal opportunity. So. I think we all just have to bottom line and insist when every boardroom we're in, every leadership role we're in, every executive suite we're in, to make sure that we don't get lumped with all the others, that people understand that this country has a, has a particular debt to all of us based upon how we've been treated in this country. Um, we have a political question. Um, so Donald Trump is peeling off some of the African-American male vote. Some of the polls show him winning between 10 and 15% of the black male vote, which would be an improvement over 2016. Is he tapping into something that Democrats are missing in your view? Um, and if so, what could that be? Yeah, we just got some polling data on this last week at VA. It was about 15% among black males, which surprised us and, uh, and trending higher. Um, the reason is, is one, he's targeting black males uh, with uh, online messages, leaflets in barbershops. And two, he recognized that what they care about the most is economics. How am I going to get me a better job? How am I going to take care of my family? I want to be in a better place than I was a year ago. Mm -hmm. Sounds like he's cutting taxes, stimulus. He's talking about the economy, things I care about. And I think Democrats w weren't targeting black people as much, black males as much. And two, they weren't talking the economic issue. They're talking more social justice, uh, reentry, criminal justice reform, other things. Those are all very important things. But if you ask, according to polling data, what people actually care about, what they're worried about right now, the economic thing is high on the list. And we weren't targeting that to black men. And it's odd to me, you know, and I've asked a lot of political leaders this question. Democrats, a generation ago, I, I mentioned this earlier, you know, Harold Washington, Coleman Young, Maynard Jackson, Marion Barry, Tom Bradley, all those pioneering mayors talked of all the time about the importance of strong black businesses and jobs in our community and building up a middle class. We saw the legacy that Maynard left in Atlanta. It was so, so wonderful. In today's age, our political leaders haven't led with that. You know, they're not talking about the importance of the black businesses, black entrepreneurs and the jobs and philanthropy that we should be creating for our own communities. And I'm not sure why we've lost that energy around these issues, but it's, it's so vital to our future that we get political leaders willing to speak out and speak up in the same spirit of what those giants did a generation ago. And then the second point I'd make, the last point I would make is we have less black mayors in this, in this city than we did 25, 30 years ago. I mean, this country that we did 25 or 30 years ago. And part of it is because we haven't been able to, this wealth gap has gotten so much larger in our country. We don't have the wealth 
to fund our own candidates. Uh, we don't have uh, wealthy enough wealthy entrepreneurs that can self-fund their own campaigns the way that white Americans can. It's not lost on me in Illinois. Our, our last governor was a private equity guy. Our current governor is a venture capital person. Our former mayor was a uh, uh, investment banker. Our current mayor was a partner in a law firm. We all know in New York City, we had Bloomberg, who was a technology titan and financial services titan. These folks are being able to use their wealth and their wealthy networks to take control of key leadership roles. And this is why this wealth gap is so extraordinarily important to our country's future if we wanna to be totally included in, and have the jobs that we deserve to have in our communities and in our cities. Yeah, that's a the social justice issues have been so front and center after George Floyd, uh, criminal justice reform, police reform, and all the politicians ran to that because that is what's on people's minds. And so it's hard to, guess, I guess, keep two thoughts in your head at the same time. And so I think the economic issues took a back seat, uh, but among the politicians, they took a back seat, but not to these black men. Yes, yeah, you know, Charles, they're tied together. You know, that yeah. you don't have wealth and this is what Nicole Hannah-Jones talks about. You're gonna have worse housing. You're gonna have worse health care. You're gonna be you know, in communities where you're gonna run into the criminal justice system. Um, again, poorer educations. All the challenges that we face in urban communities are all directly tied to wealth. And if we don't create wealth and jobs in our community, then you're gonna be susceptible to all of these horrific challenges that we face in urban communities in this country. And I think for some reason, we haven't connected the dots the way white, white Americans do. They understand that all the great things in a community come from building jobs and wealth in those communities. And if you don't have wealth and jobs, you're going to be susceptible to all these challenges. And it's just gonna get worse and worse as the wealth gap grows larger and larger. Yeah, you, both of you are you know, obviously extremely successful in the business world, but you're also very much involved in politics and civic engagement. And so I was, you know, I'm curious how you see the connection along the lines of what you're talking about and what you would recommend for folks actually from a policy point of view to both boost um, financial literacy in the black community, but also civic literacy and civic engagement in the black community. Well, I mean, I'll start on financial literacy because we've been working on this for a long, long time. Um, many of you know we started a small public school in Chicago called the Aerial Community Academy. It's a public school, not a charter school, all union teachers. Uh, after now almost 25 years, it's about 500 African-American students. And we teach the kids about the stock market. So every first grade class gets a $20,000 class gift. They watch us manage it for the first six years through aerial mutual funds. And then in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, the kids start to uh, buy real stocks with real money, uh, which is what my dad did for me when I was coming along after I was age 12. And it's been phenomenally successful. Many of the kids have worked here at Ariel as interns or full-time jobs. Many of them have gone into the financial services industry because not only did they learn about how to pick stocks and how to do research, they learned about this whole investment management world that most of the kids never thought about. Um, maybe they knew about banking, et cetera, but they didn't know about you know, long on only money management or venture capital or private equity or what have you. So the Aerial Community Academy has been a great success. Uh, former Secretary of uh, Education Arnie Duncan started the school while I was uh, while he was working at Ariel. And uh, during the Obama administration, I chaired his uh, task force on financial literacy for about six years. And the recommendation we gave to the president at the end was that we wanted the White House to use its bully pulpit to get more financial institutions and corporations to partner with urban public schools and teach financial literacy. And then finally, you know, we've done things you would imagine with the school. We, you know, we, we bring in celebrities to meet with the students from Magic Johnson to George Lucas. But we also, uh, every year for a while when Don Thompson was the CEO of McDonald's, we would take uh, 40 kids or so to the McDonald's annual meeting. And one of them would get to ask, ask a question at a real annual meeting and see Don Thompson preside. And then afterwards, Don and his wife, Liz, and the chairman of the board, Andy McKenna, would spend an hour with the young people. Um, and Andy, and uh, Don would tell them how he got to be the CEO of McDonald's and be an inspiration for these young people. So I think the number one goal, I think, is to get public schools to do their part with financial literacy and get 
large corporations and financial services institutions to partner with those urban public schools. And I think you can really make a difference uh, around this important issue. Yeah, I would say uh, on the jobs project, uh, project that I mentioned a few minutes ago, where we're trying to get 1 million black jobs created over the next year by working with about 35 large companies and all these workforce development programs. One thing that we found is, is when you find people and they haven't been in the corporate world, the financial literacy is an issue. So as part of the training, we're adding that component, what we call wraparound services. Some need that, some need childcare, some need many other things and getting them ready to be in the corporate environment. So I think if, as we get people around uh, financial services and corporations in general and give them those skill sets and do it at scale, then they start to evolve over time. So I think it's possible. So a lot of people will learn it that way. And then the second thing on the civic engagement, um, I think people are pretty motivated right now. And that's why the, you know, the voting is increasing and black people are paying attention to it and voting in record numbers. What we lack is uh, a specific ask. It's okay to talk about social justice and I'm upset, but what do I want you to do? So that's what DEA that you were instrumental in helping start that's what we're trying to do is document the things that uh, this, this is how the system works. Here's, here's where the money is. Here are the programs that are available. Here's how we want them changed. Here's the ones that need to be eliminated. Here's what we're, the ones that we want more of. So we're coming up with a specific ask so people can make this actionable. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, segue to the next question, which is, do you think that we are making the right, right ask at the moment of both the private sector that obviously wants to be helpful, but also of the government? Are we, are we being ambitious enough and asking for actual, the kinds of structural changes that make sure that this isn't just, you know, add a couple people to the board here and there, maybe add a few, you know, high level seats, but is really sort of sustainable action. I think too yeah. often we, we, de we, too, we depend on government too much and I think we're used to asking government to help and government's used to helping. And uh, I see that you know, most, corp most major cities are doing the right things when it comes to working with minority businesses and, and asking the right questions and challenging us. I think the corporations are where, and the, and the nonprofits in town, the museums, the hospitals, the universities, who sort of talk a good game, but don't really live the values of really real true inclusiveness. And um, so that's been really, pretty much of a, a major disappointment. Um, I think we have to shine a light on that uh, difference. Um, one of the things I always give examples in Chicago, we've had some great successes. The University of Chicago, for example, works with now 90 professional services or over 90 professional services companies, working with everything from black law firms to accounting firms to money managers for their endowment. They are all in all the time. Uh, Exelon Corporation has a great program to work with minority, not only work with minority owned companies, but it put enormous amount of pressure on the majority companies to um, that work with them to have minority partners and leaders on the relationship with Exelon. And they make it clear that if these corporations don't do the right thing and don't have teams that look like America, they won't be able to do business with Exelon ever again. And then finally, the Knight Foundation has not only hired minority money managers for their endowment, but they've been leading the research to show how bad things are and how little the opportunities are. And you know they've been really in the forefront there. So there are institutions out there that are doing the right things. Um, and again, the corporate world, the nonprofit world, and these can do so much more. And we as board members can be doing more to make a difference when we ask the right questions in the boardroom. And they start, they will, they'll move in this environment. But if we sit idly by and let all the economic opportunities go to white men and allow, and allow corporations to the heart of the question to get, get, get a free pass by writing a check to a great philanthropy, giving a, uh, more money to the historically black college, hiring a few new people. Those things are important, but if all the economic opportunities continue to go to the same places, nothing changes for us and our wealth gap just grows larger and larger. So you have to do everything. And so far they, 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 they love to get off the hook and not have to do the hard things. Again, working with us on a full-time basis. Yeah, I just add on to that, I do like uh, one of the aspects of the Biden plan to look at the procurement by the federal government, some 700 billion a year. Um, what's inside of that? Uh, maybe not all those uh, areas are something that black businesses have services they can offer, but we should find out and we can, should use some of that because that's what they've been doing in the past. There have been a lot of white companies that were founded based on that procurement spending. We got to start there and then uh, moved into other sectors of the economy. And so we should just make sure that you know we optimize for that as well. 
Well, we are out of time and that's a, just as good a place to end as possible. I want to thank you, John and Charles, for taking the time this afternoon to spend with us. I know that we're a few days out from the elections, so everybody's busy. And I want to thank the audience as well for joining us and uh, being a part of the series that we've had. We're all anxiously awaiting uh, the results of the next week, um, but stay tuned because there will be more programming for third way as we continue to um, explore how this pandemic and our is affecting our economic and political climate. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody.